welcome to this uh, workshop on intraoperative ultrasound in carotid endarterectomy. Um, my name is Christoph Knappig from the Department of Vascular Surgery in Munich. Uh, this is our timetable for the next uh, 45 minutes. Uh, we are going to, take about, to talk about the rational for intraoperative morphological control after carotid endarterectomy. Uh, I will give you a quick overview on data and guideline recommendations. Uh, thereafter, my colleague Tore Skierkestad is going to uh, give you a quick introduction on the Mediastin Mirror Q system. Um, then I will talk about how to perform intraoperative ultrasound, uh, give you a couple of technical tips, and uh, tell you how we, what our algorithm is in, in Munich at the moment. Um, at the end, I brought a couple of case discussions we can uh, discuss together. Uh, you're always welcome to, to ask questions in between. Uh, the, the, the workshop um, is supported by Medistim. So first I will talk about the rational for intraoperative morphological control uh, after carotid and artrectomy. Uh, the, the first randomized controlled trials comparing carotid and artrectomy to best medical treatment alone found intraoperative found perioperative stroke or death rates of about 7% in symptomatic patients and 3% in asymptomatic patients. Since then, there has been a continuous decline of perioperative stroke or death. And today we have reached numbers as low as 1.2% in asymptomatic patients and 2.5% in symptomatic ones. Interestingly, this decline of perioperative risk was um, accompanied by an increased use of intraoperative completion studies. In 2003, only um, completion studies were only performed in 45% of CA cases in Germany. And in 2015, uh, already about 70% of cases were um, followed by an intraoperative completion study. So what is the literature on intraoperative duplex ultrasound in carotid and artrectomy? We found a total of uh, 23 studies. Uh, the, the oldest dates back to the year 1988. Most of them were small uh, retrospective case series. Uh, the overall stroke or death rate was 1.9%. And we, had, we found an overall revision rate of 5.9%. Uh, one, of, one of the older studies, however, with, with a big patient number um, was this one here. It was a retrospective investigation of data from the New York Carotid Artery Surgery Study. More than 9,000 patients undergoing carotid and artrectomy uh, between 1998 and 1999 were included. Uh, only about 6% of the patient's intraoperative ultrasound was performed. And the main result was that uh, with respect to perioperative stroke, uh, there, was, uh, there was no um, significant uh, reduction in patients uh, who had any kind of intraoperative imaging. Um, the largest uh, study on this topic was performed by ourselves. It was a secondary data analysis of the German Carotid Quality Assurance Database. We included patients who underwent carotid and artrectomy between 2009 and 2014 for asymptomatic or symptomatic uh, carotid stenosis. We excluded patients who were treated for um, emergency conditions or under special conditions, uh, and finally had 140,000 patients for our analysis. The primary endpoint was any stroke or death until discharge from hospital and we performed union multivariable regression analysis. So one of the main results was that besides angiography, intraoperative ultrasound was significantly associated with a lower perioperative stroke or death rate. And this uh, result also helped to change the German Austrian guidelines slightly. Uh, after, after these results were published, a new recommendation was included uh, saying intraoperative duplex ultrasound and or angiography 
uh, should be performed as intraoperative completion studies to reduce the perioperative stroke risk. Uh, this was a level 2B recommendation. To further assess uh, the impact of intraoperative completion studies, we performed a, a systematic review and meta-analysis. Uh, we included uh, studies that were performed uh, between 1980 and 2020. We followed a predefined search strategy and identified a total of 31 uh, studies. At the end, we did a pooled analysis and meta-analysis. The pooled analysis showed that intraoperative ultrasound was significantly associated with a lower stroke rate. Angiography and angioscopy also showed a significant uh, stroke reduction. We did not find any significant result regarding mortality, but we found that intraoperative ultrasound was also, also associated with a lower stroke or death rate. Um, these results were confirmed uh, by the meta-analysis. Here also intraoperative ultrasound was significantly associated with a lower uh, stroke or death rate. And uh, if you see an image like this uh, showing a mobile thrombus at the uh, origin of the internal carotid artery, then uh, I think it becomes uh, quite clear that this can only be uh, prevented from embolizing into the brain if it is actually detected and corrected. Uh, in this study, also angiography was associated with a lower perioperative stroke or death rate. And uh, the results of this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis again helped to change the guideline recommendations. Uh, the 2017 ESVS guidelines only gave a weak recommendation uh, that targeted monitoring and quality control strategies may be considered to reduce the risk of uh, perioperative stroke. And the newest 2023 ESVS guidelines now uh, included a stronger 2A recommendation and say that for patients undergoing carotid endotrectomy, intraoperative completion imaging with angiography, duplex ultrasound, or angioscopy should be considered in order to reduce the risk of perioperative stroke. So this was the first part of our workshop. Um, are there already any questions from the, from the audience? I don't see any questions at the moment. So then I would uh, hand over to my colleague, Torres Skjekestad from Norway, and he's going to give you a, a quick technical introduction to the Medis de Miracue system. Thank you much, Torre. You, you can share your screen now. Thank you very much, Dr. Knappisch. Um, then, uh, as you said, my name is uh, Tor Shegesta. Uh, I am one of the business and product managers here at uh, Medistim. And today I'll give you a quick introduction to the Medistim uh, products. Now, uh, just quickly before we start, uh, Medistim is a very international company. Uh, so if you find yourself in one of the orange or green, blue countries on this map. Uh, we have local representation and you should be able to find one of us locally there. If you're in the gray areas, uh, we can make something work as well if you're still interested. So moving quickly on to the products here. Uh, these are our systems. Uh, they are called the Miracue systems. Uh, they are specialized for different types of vascular uh, surgical applications. Uh, the first one with the blue handles here is uh, the Miracue vascular. It is optimized for uh, vascular surgical applications, typically the carotid, savy axes, peripheral bypasses, and everything else that might be interesting. Uh, the one in the middle is the Miracue Cardiac. It is optimized for cardiac surgery. And the one on the right-hand side with the black handles is the Miracue Ultimate system that does all the things that the two other systems does. Uh, now, the Medisim solution is a fairly unique dual technology offering. It combines the transit time flow measurement technology that gives you accurate and robust flow measurements with high frequency ultrasound imaging uh, that is very good at assessing the vessel morphology and just generally seeing what is going on inside of uh, your vessels. 
and we'll start with discussing the high frequency ultrasound a little bit. Um, the uh, MedStim imaging offering is adapted for intraoperative surgery, intraoperative use, uh, and there is specific focus on the details in the ultrasound image and focus on the near field of the image where the performance is put. Um, the system, uh, of course, cannot function by itself. It needs a, a well-designed probe as well. Thankfully, we have that. It's called the L15 imaging probe. Uh, it is a high-frequency intraoperative imaging probe. As you can see from the picture, it has a very low profile. The scanning head is, uh, is made very small, specifically so it can fit into tight spaces. Uh, it is a, a sterilizable device uh, that can be used directly on uh, whatever type uh, of vessel or even directly on the heart. Range is between 11 to 18 megahertz. Uh, and that is a range that provides you with very high resolution images. Uh, and we have optimized it for performance in the first two centimeters of the image, which is, of course, where the action happens when you're doing intraoperative scanning. Uh, with this high resolution, it's very easy to see tiny details in the image, like the intimal layers and different types of plaque or other um, obstructions in the flow, uh, giving you very good information for how to plan your surgery going forward. So the first imaging mode is the standard 2D mode, also often referred to as B mode or just grayscale images. The picture we see here on the screen is uh, from a radial artery, and you can clearly see the well-defined intimal layers on top and uh, the bottom of the vessel. Uh, very important, of course, uh, in surgery to keep track of those. The next mode is uh, what we typically call the color mode or the color flow mapping, also commonly referred to as duplex scanning. This is uh, your standard Doppler uh, flow mapping technology. We have two different modes, the velocity mode, which takes the both the velocity and the direction information from the Doppler signal uh, and maps that onto the grayscale image. And then you have the power mode, which uses just the power in the Doppler signal to detect the presence of flow. This is slightly more sensitive to low flow situations, so we recommend using that in those situations. And the third mode is the uh, also well-known pulsed wave Doppler mode, uh, where you use the 2D image to guide the placement of your Doppler gate, and uh, that will provide you with a Doppler velocity spectrum underneath. The other leg of the dual technology solution is the, of course, the transit time flow measurement technology. Uh, this is an accurate and robust flow measurement uh, technology. Um, it's a well-known technology used in many places. Uh, but still, uh, just to clarify what it is and what it is not, I'm going to explain how it works um, and how it is different from a Doppler technology. So this is a cross-section of a transit time flow measurement probe and a vessel inside. And you can see on each side of the probe, there is an ultrasound transducer. These transducers take turns in uh, transmitting and receiving a ultrasound pulse back and forth between them. Um, and the pulse that gets to ride the flow downstream will be a little bit faster than the one that has to uh, struggle against the flow going upstream. Uh, so the upstream one will take a little bit more time to get there than the downstream one does. And that this tiny little uh, transit time difference is what forms the basis of the flow, uh, flow um, calculation that is provided. And that is, of course, different from the uh, Doppler technology that uses the Doppler shift and looks at the uh, change in the frequency instead of the transit time. So this is what a TTFM measurement looks like on the screen. You have the red curve, which is the mean flow curve. The mean flow is also represented as a number in the top left corner. In the top right corner, you have the pulsatility index, also an interesting parameter, uh, which is a measure of how spiky your signal is or how pulsatile the signal is. Generally, you want to have a lower pulsatility index in your measurement. Now, in order to have a good uh, and reliable flow measurement. It is important to have a probe that snugly fits your vessel. That's why medicine has a large range of different probe sizes and also different uh, probe designs. We have one with slides uh, that is for more gentle handling of vessels. And then we have one with ears, uh, silicon ears for vessels that are healthy and can handle to 
uh, be put into a probe of that type. Now, to wrap it up a little bit here, uh, I'm just going to say that the MirrorQ uh, systems are uh, very flexible and modular systems. They can be uh, configured in any way uh, necessary for the type of surgery that you intended for. And should you not want to have one with ultrasound imaging initially, you can always upgrade in the field to ultrasound imaging at a later stage. Um, I believe that was all I had to say here today. And thank you for listening to me. And uh, should you want to learn more about medicine or products, feel free to stop by our virtual booth um at later stage thank you yeah thank you Tore, for this uh great overview and now i'm going to to share my screen again good so in, in the following i'll uh, give you a a quick um insight on how we perform intraoperative ultrasound in our department in munich uh, we are using this mediastin mirror cue system we we just got to know it very well uh, we are using it together with this L15 imaging probe, which you've also seen now. And this gives, gives you a really good resolution uh, images. Tori also mentioned that you can use it together with a sterile sleeve. Uh, we are using it together with a sterile sleeve because uh, if you want to do a couple of uh, cases in a row, then it might take you too long to sterilize the, the probe to use it without a sleeve. So we, we started using it together with a sleeve. And uh, we don't have the impression that the image quality is getting worse. Um, you can do images in three modes with this uh, setup. So this would be uh, the 2D uh, B mode scan. Here you can see uh, an, an ultrasound scan right after carotid endartrectomy. This would be the distal end of the endartrectomy site, um, which looks pretty well in this case. This is the duplex scan. Um, if, if there would be uh, some stenosis, you might see some aliasing phenomenon, and that's the pulsed wave Doppler. Here again, at, at the distal end of the endartrectomy site, you can see the, the distal intima step, uh, and you see a peak systolic velocity of 98 centimeters per second, which is perfectly normal. Uh, this is our workflow. Um, so we're, um, we're starting with a transverse scan of the whole carotid bifurcation. You can see the common carotid artery splitting up into the, this is the internal carotid artery. Here, here uh, you would see the external carotid artery, and that, that's the vagus nerve uh, right adjacent to the, to the artery. Thereafter, we are doing longitudinal scans in all three modes. Um, so we are starting to do a longitudinal scan at the proximal end of the endartrectomy. This would be in the area of the common carotid artery. Here's some residual uh, plaque, but nothing we would uh, revise uh, and correct. PV uh, Doppler showing 49 centimeters per second uh, peak systolic velocity, which is also perfectly normal. After we're doing a longitudinal scan at the distal end of the endartrectomy site, this is also a normal uh, result and nothing we would uh, revise and correct. And we're doing also longitudinal scans in areas found to be suspect uh, during the initial uh, transverse scan. Uh, it can be quite challenging to uh, to interpret the defects and to, to decide whether you should revise and, uh, and correct a defect. So we implemented criteria from the literature into a four-stage rating scale. On this scale, uh, no defect um, means that there's a smooth vessel wall, there's no narrowing, no angulation, no false lumen. Uh, in the duplex scan, there's no aliasing phenomenon and the peak systolic velocity usually is below 100 centimeters per second. So this would be an example of a perfect uh, result. And you would not consider to, uh, to revise this and because there are no defects at all. Stage two on this rating scale are minor defects in which uh, you might consider an operative revision. Uh, there might be some irreg irregularities of the vessel wall. Uh, there may be a narrowing uh, below 30%. 
There might be intimal flaps uh, smaller than two millimeters in the internal carotid artery or smaller than three millimeters in the common carotid artery. Uh, there might be an elizing phenomenon in duplex uh, without any morphologic defect. And the peak systolic velocity usually is below 150 centimeters per second. So these would be minor defects, uh, smaller intima flaps in the internal carotid artery, uh, but definitely smaller than two millimeters in size. Uh, major defects are those in which an operative re revision is recommended. Uh, there might be some narrowing above 30%. Uh, there might be an intima flap in the internal carotid artery larger than two millimeters or in the common carotid artery larger than three millimeters. There might be a dissection or an occluded external carotid artery. Uh, you might find an elizing phenomenon with a morphologic defect and the peak systolic velocity uh, might be above 150 uh, centimeters per second. So this would be a major defect. You can see an intima flap in the internal carotid artery, which is larger than uh, two millimeters in size. And severe lesions are those in which an operative revision is definitely mandatory. These might be a high grade stenosis. There may even be a valve mechanism uh, or a total occlusion of the internal carotid artery. Peak systolic velocity may be above 300 centimeters per second, or there might be no flow at all. So this would be an example of a severe um, stenosis. This is the distal end of the endartrectomy site. The, the intima uh, step is lifted up by the bloodstream and causing a high-grade stenosis. You, you can also see uh, the elizing phenomenon in the duplex scan. <clears throat> and the, uh, although the peak systolic velocity is not elevated, you can see this broadened uh, spectrum, which also um, indicates a high-grade stenosis. Um, in our institution, traditionally, we were using angiography as intraoperative completion studies. And uh, when we started to use intraoperative ultrasound, additionally, we often saw that the angiogram showed a completely unremarkable result, like in this example, uh, with no um, lesion at all in the internal carotid artery but the corresponding ultrasound showed a high-grade um, defect. And this was the reason why we performed the so-called CIDEX study. CIDEX stands for Comparison of Interpretive Duplex Ultrasound and Angiography in Carotid and Artrectomy. We included 150 patients prospectively, uh, and in all patients, we performed angiography and interoperative ultrasound sub subsequently. Postoperatively, the intraoperatively obtained videos were assessed by three independent and blinded investigators, and they were rated according to this four stage rating scale I've just uh, shown to you. Uh, the main result was that intraoperative ultrasound detected a total of 22 high grade defects, which was significantly higher than the nine defects detected with an angiography. Uh, that's another example, the angiogram showing a perfect result, no uh, stenosis at all, but the corresponding ultrasound showed a couple of intima flaps at the distal end of the endartrectomy site, but also further proximally, it was revised and corrected and these intima flaps were uh, removed successfully. Um, we also calculated a Kendall's coefficient of concordance to assess for the inter-rate reliability of both techniques. And uh, this co coefficient was also significantly higher for interoperative ultrasound. And this means that IDIS um, is less dependent on the subjectivity of the rater and has a higher inter re um, reproducibility compared to angiography. Here's just another example uh, in which the angiogram showed a good result Nothing you would revise, uh, but the corresponding ultrasound in the same patient um, showed uh, this severe lesion uh, that was revised afterwards. Um, so for the last part of this workshop, 
I brought a couple of interesting cases that uh, illustrate uh, the value of this technique. Um, I want to start uh, with this case that illustrates uh, that it's that um, it might be a, an advantage of IDIS that it is a completely non-invasive technique uh, with angiography uh, and you have to puncture the common carotid artery and in very, very rare cases, you can even cause a dissection with this puncture. In this case, for example, uh, this happened. Here you can see the dissection. This was also confirmed by the ultrasound. Here you can see the dissection membrane. This is the false lumen. That's the true lumen of the uh, dissection. That's the transverse scan, also showing both lumina with the membrane in between. So it, it might be a, a, a huge advantage that intraoperative ultrasound is a completely non-invasive technique. This is a typical image we, we often see after eversion and artrectomy, because with eversion and artrectomy, you don't have as much control of the distal end of the end artrectomy site. Uh, you, ca you can't place any tacking sutures, and so it can happen that the uh, that the distal intimus step is lifted up by the bloodstream. And th that's a typical image we see after eversion and artrectomy. This was after correction. You can't see any uh, lesion anymore. That's another example. Here you can see a thrombus at the, at the origin of the internal carotid artery. That's the longitudinal scan also showing uh, thrombotic material. Uh, adjacent to the arterial wall. That's the corresponding duplex ultrasound. That's the pulsed wave uh, Doppler of, of the same patient. And after correction, uh, you still saw a couple of intima flaps in the internal carotid artery, but this is nothing you would uh, or you should uh, revise. And that's the duplex scan. It is often a difficult um, decision whether to revise and to correct uh, a defect because you can also make things worse when you revise uh, the artery. And I think this case is quite good to illustrate that. Uh, so in this case, we had some residual plaque at the origin of the internal carotid artery. Uh, this was the pulsed wave Doppler. We also had a slightly elevated uh, peak systolic velocity and here this residual plaque, so we decided uh, to revise and to correct that. After revision, it looked even worse. And while we were doing the ultrasound, we saw this uh, huge thrombus in the internal carotid artery building up. So it's always important if you um, correct defects um, that you consider to give another, uh, some more units of uh, heparin, uh, because uh, of the additional operating time, you might get a problem with the anticoagulation and uh, thrombus clots might form. So this was revised again, of course. The thrombus was removed. And at the end, this was uh, the result still with a couple of intima flaps. Uh, but um, you always have to know when to finish because otherwise uh, things can get even worse, as, as we've just seen. and. You, you, risk, uh, you might risk a stroke. Here's another case. Um, you saw some floating uh, intima flap in the internal carotid artery, which was subsequently re uh, repaired. Afterwards, there was uh, an unremarkable result. You can see some artifacts, uh, which is probably due to uh, air bubbles in between the sterile sleeve and the uh, imaging probe. So you always have to be careful that there's no air in between uh, the sleeve and the probe. Otherwise, you can get uh, those kinds of artifacts. That's another case um, in which we found a thrombus in the common carotid artery the transverse scan uh, after correction, still a couple of intima flaps, which you, most, which you see in most cases, 
but nothing uh, you should uh, revise again. Here another case, uh, also a thrombus in the internal carotid artery. Duplex scan showed a lot of aliasing phenomenon. And uh, that's the pulse wave doppler. But in most cases, the B mode is really the most important, gives you the most important information whether there is a, a technical defect or not. Yeah, after correction, this looks good. Here's some, uh, some intima flaps, but nothing you should uh, revise again. Here you can see an intima flap. Often when you see something like this, uh, this might not necessarily be in the lumen of the artery. It might be, uh, it might be at, the, at the lateral wall. So it's always worthwhile to perform a transverse scan and to see uh, if this is really in the lumen or if it's just um, hanging at the side of the artery. This was a case in which we, we had a dissection um, intraoperatively. So here again, the duplex ultrasound shows this dissection membrane and the two lumina. This case I've shown to you already, here's a huge uh, thrombus at the origin of the internal crotchet artery. Here's a similar case also with a huge thrombus at the internal crotchet artery. And this is uh, probably one of the most impressive cases I have. Um, it also shows a huge uh, thrombus in the internal carotid artery. And uh, you all, we all can imagine what happens if this is not uh, detected and not prevented from embolizing into the brain. So I think this illustrates quite well uh, the value of this technique. This was after correction. So coming to the end of this uh, workshop, I'd like to conclude that uh, the intraoperative use of intraoperative completion studies might have contributed to the improved outcomes of carotid and artrectomy. Um, there are no uh, randomized controlled trials to date, but non-randomized trials indicate a beneficial effect of intraoperative ultrasound. And this is also why uh, recent guidelines recommend the use of intraoperative completion studies. Compared to angiography, IDAS has a higher sensitivity to detect defects, and it has also a higher inter-observer reliability compared to angiography. However, at the end, it will be a very subjective decision by the surgeon whether to revise or not. And it definitely takes some uh, take some time and a learning curve to uh, find out for, for yourself which um, defects you should revise and which you can leave. So thank you very much for your attention. And uh, I am open for any questions from the, from the audience. Okay, so until now, I don't see any questions in the chat. So I think we're a little bit ahead of time. But if there's, there are no questions, then uh, I think we, we, we'll stop a little bit earlier. Thank you very much for your attention. Um, and have a good Friday and weekend. Bye-bye.